everyone. My name is Danny Shafe, and I'm a business attorney in Oak Brook, Illinois. And as part of my series where I interview business owners, I have today the owners of Ipso Facto Docketing. I have Hudakrad Balin and Russell Balin. They are a super cool couple, and I know Huda for from a very long time ago. And I'm very excited to have them on today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Anytime. So. Um, they do trademark and patent docketing. We're going to talk about their business and not only what they do and why they do. I like to talk about businesses and why the business owners do what they do because I do believe people show up to their business um, as a reflection of who they are and their why. So I'm going to turn it over to you all. So why don't you tell me about your company and what you do? So docketing in general is the management of the dates and um, correspondence associated with the process of getting a patent or trademark. Uh, that process can take uh, several years, mm -hmm. depending on what it is. And during that time, there's a lot of correspondence between the government mm -hmm. and the person who's trying to get a patent or trademark. And that activity has to be tracked because there's a lot of uh, deadlines and things like that, and that's where docketing comes in, and every intellectual property firm, attorney, you know, uh, company in the world has a docketing department to help their clients manage that activity. So, you're so your clients are probably clients who have a lot of trademarks, and I think you were telling me that even a company with like 50 trademarks is too small. So how, like, so who is your ideal client? Anybody right. who is too busy to manage their own docket mm -hmm. would be our ideal client. Uh, 50 trademarks, just as an example, doesn't generate a lot of activity in a you know, short amount of time so that one person can't handle it, mm. unless you file 50 trademarks at the same time, which nobody does. So uh, generally, companies that have patents and trademarks that are between 100, 300 to 20,000 mm -hmm. need people to manage the docking part mm -hmm. of it. So that's, those are who our clients are. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the most challenging part of what you do? Uh, it's the children. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about that. All right, so tell me about that. Um, you guys are a couple and mm -hmm. you have three kids. Um, so tell me more about that. So we so didn't always work together and many couples don't often work together however part of our story is that we met at work mm. and so having a being part of our work culture work ethic um, part of our work day is not um, unusual for us however we weren't in the same practice group mm. and then you know 10 12 years later we've come back full circle and starting a company together and providing a service together doesn't feel brand new. It doesn't mm. feel strange. It feels like, yeah, we've always kind of been heading in that direction anyway. So the kids add to it, you know, we, um, however, it's, it's exciting. It's fun. Um, because we do work out of our house. Right, mm -hmm. right. That's why. And we work well together, which is. <laughs> we do, we do. Yeah. Uh, the reason I said about the kids is that's the hardest part is because yeah. trying to mm -hmm. have a meeting or just concentrate on a project, or try to get a contract done. Right. Like she, she, who was working on the other day, mm -hmm. you know, kids have no concept of what that is, of course, and why would they? And yeah. they're just like, ah, trying to get in that, <laughs> you know. I think post-COVID, everybody yeah. gets that. Like, we're like, yeah, we've sure all been yeah. there. Like, kids I think pre-COVID, right. people were like, well, that's just like, yeah. why would you do that? But now, I think post-COVID, everyone's yeah. like, they, and so many people are working from home, and they're still working from home. So I've got a lot of us still experience that challenge. Yeah. Um, and then I went also just working from home, especially if it's full time, is is uh, it's hard to separate like your personal life and your business. Like I know for me, um, is that I I can never like shut my work off. Like so in part because if you're working from home, but also being the business owner. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage it like, as a couple? Like okay, now we're like in family mode versus business owner mode. Do you guys have like a uh, an SOP for that, or is it just like, are you, maybe you don't talk no, about that. No, no, they go hand yeah, in hand. they're enmeshed, yeah. They're completely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, every single thing that pops up during the course of the day or the evening, because I often we have to work in the evenings right. as well, uh, it's 
or are you going to take it? Am I going to take it? Who's going to take it? Yeah. And and it's sort of a shorthand that we have depending on what each of us is working on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Priorities. We definitely have to prioritize. Yeah. I don't feel maybe because you said it's post COVID era. Well, we like it's kind of like a relay race. You know, sometimes the way we work. Where he handles yeah, I can see so that much, yeah, he handles so much of the operation side of things, but then there's things that need uh, legal review, legal approval, mm. legal drafting, and then I jump in. Uh, nothing gets to start until I handle that, and so we work, we work together. Pass the baton back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe sometimes it's on fire. <laughs> sometimes it's on. Fire. We work well under pressure. Yeah. Today, but that's, that's good. Yeah, I don't over simulation. Yeah. That's good. It's that's good that that you can work well under pressure. I think when you have kids and you're at home, mm -hmm. and it's, it's definitely a skill that, that um, to be honed on. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's what we do with managing the family side of it right. as well. Because, you know, one minute it's business, the other minute it's family, and yeah. so, you know, who's taking it, I'm taking it, you're taking it, and so. I think, I think that's really awesome. Um, and that, like, I know a lot of couples who, who, like, they are, like, business owners together, and they all, Seem to have like the same experience, especially in the startup phase too, mm -hmm. when you don't really have like a team to, like you are the team, right? And so mm -hmm. you're tag teaming, and you're you're wearing multiple hats. One day you're the business owner, one day you're the you know like production, or one day you're like my email's not working, and you're like the tech person or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so tell me a little bit about what made you even want to start your business. Um, I think we have completely different answers to this. So you yes. go first. <laughs> it was a function of a result of external forces. So I was laid off and the position I had from which I was laid off was the peak of my career. I was involved in business development, I was involved in operations, I was involved in training, um, <clears throat> uh, all aspects of uh, you know managing the client's relationship with the company with the other departments mm -hmm. that they came to this company for, because there's other aspects of managing intellectual property that our company doesn't handle, mm -hmm. but that you still need to do if you own a patent or a trademark. Uh, and that was the most I had ever done. So getting laid off, I couldn't go back to being a you know, paralegal or something. And uh, so I was sort of forced Mm. You know, if I wanted to provide for my family or maximize my earning potential, those kind of you know boring statements that we yeah. make as adults, uh, then you know I had to consider my wife's idea, who she had been pitching for ten years, yeah. that I could do this by myself. Why is there patience? <laughs> but you know, I think that sometimes when we say that we waited a long time to do something, sometimes it is the best time. You know, like sometimes a delay isn't necessarily mm. a bad thing. There are certain things that we have to go through in life to be primed to actually do something oh, successful. It was, yeah. right. it was the exact right time. But you know, it's an idea you plant it and it doesn't really become real yeah. until it's the time for it to become real. And you know, I think Russell's reason was from his perspective, um, exactly as he put it, my reason was as the witness beside him. Not only did I work with him, I also witnessed the kind of person he was in a professional atmosphere for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. I witnessed how he um, treated his clients. I witnessed how he put out fires for them. I witnessed how much they needed him. I witnessed how much they appreciated him. I witnessed kind of what is commonly experienced by a lot of people who work in a corporate um, setting which is you are employed, you get your paycheck, you get right. your health insurance, you have a service skill that you provide for the company and in return they pay you your salary and you kind of climb up and sometimes you stay where you are, but you do your thing, but you're dependent, right. very much dependent. <clears throat> and the service you provide is very much narrowly directed towards the benefit of the corporation mm -hmm. that you're in. You know this, you right. work as a um, business attorney. Mm -hmm. You don't just have the capability to benefit one company. Right. You have the, the ability to, to, to benefit many. So I saw potential for growth. I saw a potential for how we can, um, I guess, multiply the service that he was offering. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, what happens is, is you know, he, he does mention um, 
you know, humbly that he was laid off. And you see that picture in movies all the time. Somebody gets fired from a job and they walk out of their job and they just have this cardboard yeah. box. <laughs> and in that cardboard box is the frame of the picture that was on the desk plus that monkey yeah. face out of and the few personal pieces of paper that you had. And what does that say? It's basically, it's basically the way, um, you know, corporate culture wants to condition you to believe that your value is just what you can carry home in your, mm. your box. Yeah. And I don't believe that that's true at all. Right. I think what you take home with you when you leave your job, whether you quit or you were fired, right. is the skill, the expertise, the service that you were able to provide that your company needed you for in the first place. Right. And so when he came home with that, we had an option. You either go get another job like the one you had and yeah. provide the same service and climb in the same way, or we do the risky route, which I think we should talk about risk. Yes. Bit, but <laughs> we go the risky route, um, and you take the service and the skills that you've attained and multiplied over the last you know 25 years of your career, and you provide it in a unique way that will multiply as well. And so that's like that's that. what we did. And like because you know I, I I talk with a lot of business owners and with you know business coaches even and we talk about this idea of like the revenue of a business right mm -hmm. and and I think sometimes people get put off by just hearing numbers and you know there's a lot of um, what can I say there's a lot of um, chatter about like you know wealth and money and all mm -hmm. of that but one way to look at how much a business makes all things being equal is that the revenue of a business is a reflection of the value that it provides to society because the more revenue you bring in it's just a sign again you know obviously you know just everything being on board and you know that you're helping people this is you know like a, you know like a 20 million dollar business is helping more people than you know a two million dollar business mm -hmm. for example it's just the idea of that when you serve more people um, you are you are providing more value, um, mm -hmm. or like you're spreading the value around. I guess I think business ownership is not for everybody, for sure, as I'm sure you can attest to. And there's nothing wrong with being employed, but for you know, I think people for you know like us, where we just have this desire to spread our skills, and we think that we have more to contribute to this world. And it's also the this idea of self value. You yeah. are more valuable than that cardboard box and what it contains. Right. Right. You you know you may feel in the moment that the highest you can climb within mm -hmm. a corporation yeah. is whatever position they have created. And then once they've eliminated the position, you feel like you're just like pushed back down yeah. that ladder. But I don't see it so much as like a ladder you're climbing. It's kind of more like a, like a trampoline. <laughs> like you I jump, like that. You jump on the down trampoline, and up. <laughs> climb up, and then you fall a little bit, but then you come back up. Sometimes you you know fall right on your back, and sometimes you know, you're soaring. And yeah. so it's kind of like that. <laughs> that sounds terrifying, but that actually kind of like bungee jumping. Yes. <laughs> So you talked about um, like Russell's why, but is your why? This sounded like when, when you tied your why to Russell's why, but you had it's your own different. why. No, yeah. It's different. No, um, different. Have you ever had that job where you are working and you are providing a very important service right. and you are doing really difficult work, mm -hmm. hard work? You're getting paid for it. But at the end of the day, you go to your your review and the person who's giving you your review in your company is complaining more than they are validating or celebrating. Yeah. And I feel like that happens in companies a lot, uh -huh. regardless of what your, you know, what the profession is. It happens a lot, and I witnessed it um, both in my employment uh -huh. prior to owning our own business, but I also witnessed it working beside you for many, many, many years. Yeah. And so part of starting a company is because your eyes are wide yeah. open. You don't take the service and the skills that you have the power to share with others. You don't take them for granted. Mm -hmm. You don't misunderstand your capacity for success. You don't look for things to criticize. Mm -hmm. You really do see um, the value in the service that you have available and honestly that's the way to profit off of it yeah like if you don't know what value your employees or your team can bring forth at your place of employment you're really not maximizing how much you can benefit mm. from what they what they bring to the table and so i witnessed yeah. that and so it became clear and safe to me when he had a choice to make well what are we going to do next 
are you gonna go repeat the same thing, the yeah. same process? Or are we going to um, do it a different way? And I think that's where you know the question of risk came up and you know starting you know a company when you've done it only one way your entire career and then starting a company to provide that service that's scary yeah um uh, and you know we can talk about that a little bit uh, i don't come from a culture where risk is so <laughs> no, um, <laughs> at all it's like you are actually i'm gonna i'm gonna go back on that but you, you, know, you know what I, yeah we but our parents are immigrants that is like the riskiest thing, leaving your family. Okay, so I'm not talking about that Okay, okay. Part, but yes, <laughs> In they general, took okay. risks leaving. Right. But with that risk that they took, yeah. leaving their um, homeland, their homeland yeah. coming here, uh, it conditioned them to see um, the, the safety net mm -hmm. of secure job choices, which is why they yes. come here and they say, become a doctor. Yeah. They teach yeah. you to take risks. No, yes. they took the risk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, now be safe. Yeah, so I, right here, I, I get that. Now be safe. And all, if you become a doctor, yeah. you will have a secure job. You will never need it, be wanting of anything. Yeah. But if you're going to do this risky job, like, and I mean, I went to college in the 90s. Like, becoming a lawyer was unheard of back yeah. then. Yeah. You know, and other, um, any other profession yeah. other than medicine yes, was yes, too that's true. In your risky. In, your in my book, it, yes, yeah. our, it was yeah. too <laughs> risky. You grew up way different, but like it was risky, yeah. and you don't take those risks. Um, yeah, you know, and so to be conditioned to not take risks, and then to take risks as you yeah. um, have already progressed in your career that much, yeah. it was it was a tricky step to take. That is, I, I get that. Yeah, I, I think you know, especially as immigrants. Having any other career path seemed like it's just like why why would you right and it's, mm -hmm. it's like what do you even do you know you're so like poor <laughs> like I, I don't know I, I I hate to put these you know like these judgments but it seems like being a physician is like you know top you know creme de la creme and like and, and like mm -hmm. pretty much anything else is just not worthy of anyone's time and there's also like status you know associated with it and. Being a doctor and going through that process is definitely not easy. No. But 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 the way I understand, like in Syria, the way that they organize how people's careers are chosen is that people don't choose their own careers, right? They, they take into it. A, yeah, they take like yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they take the test, and then the system tells them what they are, what they qualify for. for. Yes, yeah. and so you have to get a certain score mm -hmm. to even be a doctor. And then the lowest, I think, are like religious scholars, and that probably explains <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so they are teachers, mm -hmm. but 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 they're definitely at the bottom. And so so coming here with this mentality is like at the top. First of all, even choosing your career is probably like mm -hmm. a little bit foreign. Mm -hmm. And so you, you like you don't even like you don't even have to be liable for for your choice because someone else is making that choice for mm -hmm. you and if it doesn't work out you can say well I didn't choose okay. you know so I'm mm -hmm. kind of off the hook so there's kind of a less or excuse me, like a loss of sense of responsibility mm -hmm. but also like and I think with that comes or like you lose the appetite for risk mm -hmm. because you don't you don't you don't take responsibility because you're conditioned not to you know that, that point brings to mind a change that happened in you Russell when um, you know five years ago you you know, if we had talked about starting our own business, you were like so like, oh my God, I, I can't even fathom that. And then you were so ready for it. What changed? Good question. My last job, the four years of running a department, mm -hmm. uh, I was able to see every aspect of this corporation and my place in it. Mm -hmm. And I was able to force my way into other aspects of it uh, so that I could gain the most education mm -hmm. uh, and previous to that I didn't know how to take a business meeting I didn't know mm -hmm. how to speak to clients because my I didn't have any clients the attorneys I worked for in the law firms that those mm -hmm. were my clients so you know I would what am I going to say to a prospective client I know nothing right but four years taught me a lot mm -hmm. you know? Marketing and I sales. took yeah and I took risks this mm -hmm. is the thing that because I'm dealing with somebody now uh, just you know, peripherally, who is a quintessential, uh, you know, young person, just has a job, you know, just wants to do their job and go home, and that's fine. I was there for years, way yeah. past the point when I shouldn't have been, <laughs> you know, older than I should have been. But, you know, there are people in, 
uh, in America who just like, this is my job, I'm gonna do it. They're paying me for it, they're lucky to have me, yeah. but this is all they're paying me, so this is all I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. It's that, it's, it's that phrase, uh, to act your wage. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> but what they're, and what I wanna say to those people yeah. is, you're missing the point. Yeah. The, they're paying you exactly what you're worth, mm -hmm. but this is your chance to become worth more yeah. by investing more in your yeah. position, mm -hmm. because that's how you grow your position. Right. When you do more than what you're being paid for, they will rely on you mm -hmm. and they will promote you or you move on and someone else will promote you. Right. They don't see it that way. Everybody wants the cart before the horse, yeah. but you know that's not how you get ahead and that's not yeah. how you grow. And how do you deal though with uh, company uh, cultures and bosses who put more on your table than you're getting paid for and then they take advantage of you and you need your job and you can't quit and it's scary to quit. Yeah, that's um, fun too. That happens as well. I mean, I, I, I hear you and I, I, feel, I feel that very much and I've seen you succeed because of your, your work ethic and that philosophy, but I'm, I, I'm also um, you know, privy to yeah. the experiences that a lot of young people have where they enter a job, it's entry level, they start working and they get really good at it, but then the team say, oh, just give it to her. She can do it. And yeah. then they give you work that you're not getting paid for, but you're kind of like backed into a corner because you, know, you don't even get the credit for it. You don't get the credit yeah. for it. But yeah, like how do you differentiate when do you uh, take that step versus, I think I know what you're talking yeah. about because there are some people that are just like, look, I will never. Yeah, that's just more. their mindset. Yeah, I yeah. will never do more. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But you know, every two yeah. years, mm -hmm. practically, if you look at my resume, except for the time when we, I spent at the company that we yeah. met, I went on to another job. Yeah. You know, but Russell, they actually tell you the opposite, that apparently employers, when they would look at your resume, they don't want to see um, these short like stints because then they feel insecure about hiring someone. Well, I wasn't telling people to do that. Right, no, but I'm saying people don't feel like they can do that. Like, that's good that you did that, and that, but, but I can... But I can be sympathetic to people who, who like they probably started off with this ideal world. Yeah, I promote more for that, but then slowly over time, these companies kind of I think it depends wear on the practice away. group. Yeah, I really do think it depends on the practice group and the nature of your work because yeah. you know, for for us, if working at a law firm, they want to see you stay. Because yeah, then you, you know, you go yeah. from being an associate to you know a senior associate to from a partner to you know you just keep moving up. Right, but um, I think. There are some jobs, and Russell experienced this, where after two to four years, yeah. you have solved the company's problem, and right. either you're going to quit or they're going to fire you. Yeah. Or I have grown too. as much as I can yeah. grow, right. yeah. or as grown. much as they're going to allow me yeah. to grow, so yeah. I go somewhere else. To grow yeah. more. Yeah. To grow somewhere else. Yeah, to grow more. It exactly. really depends. Yeah. Yeah. I know when I was hiring, I hired someone who, who was at, the com at their company for a long time. I learned that their skill became very limited and because they were only doing the same thing for 20 years. So I actually didn't see it as a problem if someone moved around um, mm -hmm. a lot. I, I asked why and mm -hmm. sometimes they had really good reasons and mm -hmm. and I know that maybe some people might not stick around and, and, I, and I get it. I always thought you want to show your loyalty to a company. Yeah. And so, and but I yeah, like it's all over the place. And, and I think the depends. smarter yeah. approach is, is always it depends. Like yeah. for example, for us, I, I would ask you like, to explain your um, approach to hiring inexperienced doctors versus experienced doctors. So according to that philosophy, which I think is way too rigid, and I know it's not yours, yeah. but it's just one we hear a lot, is that uh, something about, there's something telling about someone's experience yeah. being loyal to at yeah. one place, but there's also a problem with that because you've set, you put yourself in one niche and you're incapable of, of adjusting. You're yeah. incapable of growing. You're incapable of trying things in different ways and then you break before you bend. Russell has a really interesting philosophy that he actually encourages his, some of his clients to take, which is when hiring a doctor, no, do not give me an experienced one. Mm -hmm. Give me someone brand new mm -hmm. who has no idea yeah. what they're doing and sure. please explain why. I think it's, yeah. I think it's a unique approach. Because a, a quality employee is going to be one who has a quality character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Skills can be taught. Right. right. Uh, if you're a good enough teacher yeah. and you're patient enough and you understand what you're supposed to be teaching and you uh, alleviate the burden of learning 
from your students because uh -huh. everybody is stressed when they have to learn something new and you make it about we're going to do this together yeah. and I'm going to share with you the knowledge that you need to be successful in this job then it again it comes down to yeah. character how is this person yeah. as a person right. will they uh, commit themselves will they be organized will they be disciplined will they be you know intellectually curious as opposed to the people who are experienced in what in this particular role you know doctors for instance as, as an example mm -hmm. where they are set in their ways mm -hmm. and they will want to learn the way that they sh that I do it mm -hmm. and the way that I do it is yeah. the best way obviously because mm -hmm. I'm in yeah. charge of what I'm doing uh, you know for me that is you know and your clients they agree with you <laughs> and my clients exactly yeah. and so uh, you know it it's it's butting my it's you know hitting myself against a wall when I had people who were experienced right. doctors because they couldn't get out of their own way. Right, right. They couldn't unlearn the bad habits that they had. And so many of the habits that we have mm -hmm. as workers mm -hmm. have nothing to do with knowledge right. and everything to do with our physical approach to work, especially as a doctor. Right. You know, what are the steps I'm going to do when I look at this piece of paper and I have to do it? Well, everybody else has their own ways to do it. No, my way is it doesn't matter if you know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. It's the way you look at it. That's, yeah. that's the most important thing. So, you, I need people I can mold, yeah. who yeah. want to be molded, yeah. and who are, you know, trustworthy. <laughs> One thing I noticed when I watched Russell train people over the years, and I watched Russell not only um, bring on clients and onboard clients, but mm -hmm. maintain them and put up fires for them, is um, you experience in business this desperation to uh -huh. keep your clients happy because right. the client is the paycheck the client right. is how the business exists and functions in the first place so when you have clients you do everything you can mm. to maintain that relationship and to keep them happy um, and to provide a service with integrity but you do it because you need them right and I knew that entering into a business relationship with Russell was the right choice for this very reason was that over the years I witnessed that he treats the clients with the same integrity and sense of value as he treats his team internally yeah. who are lower on the um, uh, you know on the on the metaphor <laughs> metaphorical pyramid yeah. but he treats them with the same I need you yeah. you are valued you are you are necessary we can't do this without you and that same kind of um, not desperation, but right. like it's like the the client is like whatever you need, and the employee is whatever you need, and that balance yeah. is critical for like harmony yeah. and um, that loyalty you were talking about earlier um, is was felt real mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes you know when, when if people tell you have make sure you have seven years on your resume with the company because that shows that you're loyal. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, our company is really entitled to your loyalty. Yeah, and I agree. The so loyalty not. needs to come right. come from the company. Right. You said the loyalty is not free. So. It's not free. So it's uh, not free. I heard you had a zero turnover rate. So. But yeah, in four years, they didn't leave. You know, because they believed what I told them, which was that I I support them as right. individuals. Yeah. Beyond what they can contribute to the company. Yeah. But if it's the better for their life to go do something else, they should go do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's the truth about how I feel. Yeah. Because I can always train somebody else, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and that inspired a lot of loyalty from them. I didn't know it was going to, but right. it, it was the only way for me to be. Yeah. Was that I care about you, I'm spending yeah. time teaching you. Uh, you know, we are what's going on right now. The company will survive whether we're here or not. Do what's right for your life. And I, I think they appreciated that. Yeah. They appreciated my investment in them as yeah. people. Yeah. for their own development yeah. you know I didn't want them to just learn this and stay here I wanted them to learn keep going and keep going and that way they could do all sorts of things and they loved it that was more than what the company wanted them to do yeah you know? and I think that's still a good business economic decision too because how much does it cost to find someone new and to rehire and train them yeah. there's a lot of you, that's yeah right. so I think the extra little investment in people to keep them um, and treat them as human beings is still good for the bottom line if there are people who only like set on that standard But I agree like just treating people as humans is 
is, 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 is not only good for them, but it, it's good for us. It keeps our humanity intact as well. What I learned <laughs> most importantly was that the truth is also the right thing. I was upfront with all the people that I worked with that were clients and all the people that I worked with that were employees. And because of that, they were loyal to my word and they were loyal then to their account because they knew I was looking out for them mm -hmm. beyond the borders of my responsibility to my company. I even got you know, emails from people within the company saying, I can't believe you said that to the client. I'm like, I did because I value the relationship we have with them. Yeah. And you can be mad at me, but you know, if we admit our mistakes and then do whatever we can to fix them, the client will be happy. Yeah. Trust us, yeah. But I wanted to say earlier was, the inspiration and for teaching people the way that I taught people, or the, my training philosophy came from Huda because the way that she teaches people is I'm going to show you how to do it all, mm -hmm. and every mistake you make we're going to make together. Right. But I'm going to show you. Basically, that's I stole it from her. Basically, <laughs> if you don't know what how to do it, it's because I didn't give you a chance to do it. But I, you know, with the way she teaches writing and whatever. It's sort of this foolproof, you know, uh, way of teaching writing that they can't yeah. fail. One very common request that Russell gets from clients is, is help us figure out how we can be more efficient. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Efficiency yeah. requires open-mindedness. Yeah. Because every client does things differently. Every client does things differently. <laughs> and so if the doctor yeah. is going to come in with all this experience and it's like, I only do it this way, yeah. how are they going to assist a client to be more efficient in the ways they do yeah. things. And so, you know, it, it, it helps to have somebody be more willing and able to adapt and adjust the way, their ways of doing things than to have, I don't know, 15 years of doing it one way and only one way. Yeah, and the way that I train those people and the way that I do train people is, again, uh, things are easy to add on and take away without diluting the efficiency, the productivity, and the purity of what they contribute to their client's portfolio. So, you know, a doctor who I've trained can easily, uh, you know, change the way they're working right. to suit the client because, they, you know, what they do, the way that I've trained them is not dependent upon, you know, any other factors mm -hmm. of how to work because I, I've shown them the way, mm -hmm. so to speak. So I, I want to change, just switch a little Do it. gears. Yeah. <laughs> is, um, but it sounds like, I mean, for me, uh, like this is my experience, is that I, as a business, o excuse me, so as a business owner, I learned so much about human behavior. I'm almost like a psychologist now. <laughs> so, you know, learning what motivates people, um, trying to really understand or like learn a person's character, like how do you assess someone's character, how long do you give someone, mm -hmm. you know, like before you, um, you know, make a conclusion, um, and, and I think we're, we're forced to undo a lot of our, like the ideas that we grew up with, like even the idea of hiring someone with more experience versus someone with no experience, or, or you know, how we train people or how we motivate people, like that's something that we have to do, especially when we hire people more new, like you want to be able to give them feedback without, without like breaking them, mm -hmm. and, and at what point are you micromanaging, or what, or you're just like you know like you're creating a process, and so I just I'm like yeah I'm like a somewhat of a psychologist now, <laughs> you know, so, so so what's the biggest thing that you learned about human behavior in general, like now that you're like managing people, you're you kind of have to assess people's character for the purpose of your business, but if there is something that's surprising to you or like oh I. Wish I knew this sooner, what would it be? I, I, offhand, what I've told clients, you know, uh, you know, I know what my philosophy is about how to deal with that. But as far as training people, um, mm -hmm. the thing that I discovered that works magic, basically, right. if you, uh, is you remove, the, you remove the obstacle that everybody has when they have to learn something new, and that's blame. Blame. Mm -hmm. When I take it, I take the responsibility of their failure, mm. then they are no longer afraid to try mm -hmm. and to fail. Mm -hmm. I also tell them that they have to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I expect them to make mistakes. They should expect themselves to make mistakes and to understand that that's part of, that's an right. essential part of learning. Right. 
everybody thinks they can learn without making mistakes, but nobody ever does. Because <laughs> we're everybody, so scared. <laughs> and everybody hates making mistakes because they feel like it's a failure. Yeah, well, that's and what we're taught, yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, I told them, every single one of them, your failures are my failures, right. they're not yours. Right. You show up every day, that's your success. Yeah. You don't learn what I was trying to teach you, that's mm -hmm. my failure. Right, right. Yeah. You learn what I was trying to teach you, that's your success. Right. And my success. I like that. So then, once that was removed and there was no anxiety, yeah. then it was a question of just uh, guiding them and then calling them out when they're, you know, full of crap about something. <laughs> yeah. yes. And by that point, I've earned their trust enough where they yeah. can accept the fact that, yeah, you're right, Russell, I yeah. was full of crap. Yeah. Uh, and when I say, you know what, I expected you to know this because you've proven to me right. the previous three months you knew this already. Mm -hmm. And they are disappointed, yeah. but not defeated. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. they come back and stronger, and they, mm -hmm. they they figure out where they went wrong, or the fact that they weren't paying attention or something, and they fix it. But it's when you do those types of things, it's when you teach them yeah. to to take more responsibility or to take less responsibility. That's yeah. as important as mm -hmm. how you teach them. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I mean, with my employees, I'm always like, most mistakes we can fix, and because. Uh, you know, especially if they were new, it was like I saw them kind of having a paralysis or I'm not sure. And I was like, listen, most things you can fix, uh, you know, like if, you know, like, you, like even if you send out an email by accident or, you know, most people are understanding, just, you know, you can send a follow up and say, yeah. it was a mistake. Yeah. Um, or if, like if you put in information that's incorrect, we can go fix it. Because, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't want this like fear of failure to be paralyzing. Mm -hmm. and, and as business owners and employers, like we have to know how to coach you know our people um, so that they that they feel confident and they trust us mm -hmm. with you know with um, you know like with working for us well, another part of yeah. it too is acknowledging how long it takes yeah that was we good. acknowledge <laughs> for our docketing team hey this is gonna take you six months mm. we give them this long chunk of time and we're like by month two you may start understanding what you're looking at. Right. By month three, I'm starting to test you. And then maybe maybe at the six month mark, you'll be pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then we'll start giving you real work. And giving them that time span uh, gives them that peace of mind, like you're not getting thrown into this right. um, and you have to know what you're doing as soon as you walk in the door. And I think that helps a little bit. It does, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure it does. And, and along the way, uh, and you said the word coach, which mm -hmm. is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, people need to be encouraged. Right, without scaring them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you need to know when Encourage you can yeah. and you be mad at them. And yeah. It's like raising children, right? You need to know when you can yell at them yeah. and when they will receive that yeah. yelling in a productive way. Yeah. And when you can He doesn't yell literally them. yell yeah, at them. No, <laughs> He's using that metaphorically. Right, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. What I mean by that it's is like my firm, my firm tone as opposed yeah. to my gentle tone. Yeah. You know, it, it worked. And, I, you know, it came about very organically because I, I needed them to learn everything so specifically. Right. It's docketing especially, IP docketing especially. You make a mistake mm. and it's, a big deal. it's oh, huge well, I because, <laughs> because I mean, yeah. you have a multi-million yeah. dollar investment in this yeah. piece of a this asset yeah. that you're That's why it takes doing. A long time. Yeah. And I, if you yeah. don't talk it something correctly, then the attorney who is relying on you mm -hmm. will miss something they're supposed yeah. to do, and then they have to either pay a fortune or they lose it. Right. Yeah. Because they, they didn't do what they were supposed to do with you know send a paper to the government, mm. and then the competition for that for IP is yeah. insane. So a doctor's responsibility is incredible. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I m micromanage them. Yeah. Uh, or clear checklist, but process, make sure. Yeah. Literally yeah. micromanages. Yeah. And, and it's and it's good. Yeah. It was a good micromanage. Yeah. Yeah. It was it's good. good. They feel safer. This was a great conversation. Obviously, we go on for hours. <laughs> so I have a lot of questions to say, but I wanted to thank you both for coming on. Um, if someone is interested in your services, what is the best way for them to contact you? Um, well, uh, we do have our website where you can easily contact us at www.ip-sofacto.com. And it's going to be in the comments. So yeah, you and you yeah. can also find us on Instagram. Um, oh, okay. We're on LinkedIn. 
They can contact you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they can contact me. Call our office at 620 <laughs> and we will send you a <laughs> Well, thank you both again for coming. Um, and thank you. That's a wrap. <laughs>